Hey, this is LOA Today, the Law of Attraction show. Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and Joel Elston here. It's Thursday, December 1st, 2016, the last month of December. And uh, the last month of December, I mean, there, there has a lot of different meanings for different people, Joel. We're, we're between the major holidays of the year, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, and uh, Christmas, I guess, the biggest thing we associate with Christmas is family and love and uh, just celebrating, celebrating the good things in life. Um, so from that perspective, you and I kind of thought, why not talk about bonding? Because bonding plays a major role not only in our lives, but it also plays a pretty important role in the law of attraction, too. Well, in bonding to our ideas, bonding to the law of attraction, and, and learning uh, that tuning in process is such an important piece. And it, it doesn't work without learning how to sort of bond with the concept. That's true. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. It's, it's not just bonding with people. It's bonding with concepts. So that's absolutely true. One of the things that I've run into this week a lot over the last uh, uh, five, six days is the importance of bonds in my life. Um, I've been dealing with a number of things, which we talk about uh, off the show. And uh, when you're struggling with stuff or dealing with stuff or trying to get your attitude up or get your, your, place, you know, your mind in a positive place, that sort of thing, boy, oh, boy, do the bonds you have with the most important people in your life do they really matter? That that's when they really come to the fore. And if you've got, if you're lucky enough to have really great relationships with the people who are closest to you in your life, oh my goodness, that makes all the difference. That's what makes it possible to get through the difficult times, the challenging times, the times where you feel like you're behind the eight ball and then you know the worst domino could fall at any second. When you got those bonds, man, they make all the difference in the world they certainly do walt and i i as you know i i currently have a foster child living with me and i've fostered children before and around the holidays in particular uh i tend to look at bonding uh, from probably a perspective our audience doesn't have the opportunity to look at i i have a currently have an 11 year old uh young man he's an outstanding kid that i really enjoy having with me uh but he's actually been removed from his family at 11. That's so tough. That, that's a tough thing to go really through is. right there. Just the fact that, right I mean, there. I'm sure that he went through a lot of stuff. I mean, that doesn't, right. that kind of transition doesn't happen because the family was wonderful. There, there were problems going on there. But even so, I mean, he does, he, he's just getting to know you. He's just barely understanding who you are. I mean, from the reports that I've seen on Facebook, you guys are hitting it off, which is wonderful. But still, that, that's a tough transition. It really is. And, and uh, last weekend we went to, uh, for Thanksgiving, we have a, a an annual tradition of, we go to South Carolina. My family's always, you know, we were there for several years. So we go back and we have uh, very dear friends we spend Thanksgiving with. And we have a a, a big paintball war for those familiar oh. <laughs> with paintball, where, where we, we shoot each other with paintballs. Uh, that's always exciting. And this weekend, this trip in particular, a very dear friend of mine got his court side seats for the uh, uh, Charlotte Hornets and the New York Knicks Saturday, the Saturday evening that we were down there. Um, and my foster kid was able to uh, uh, dance at on center court uh, with the Hornets mascot at halftime. Wow. <laughs> what a great thing for an 11 year old kid. I mean, that's the best. Oh, it is. And, and the process for me was just sort of my mind sort of wandered of it wandered in the direction of and, and where he is at that moment. You know, what an incredible journey, what a distance he traveled just at 11, not necessarily mileage wise, but life wise uh, to, to be sitting there. And his as him and I bond and we we're in the middle of a bonding process, we're learning each other. Um, you know, the honeymoon is over, so to speak. He's he's an 11 year old boy and being an 11 year old boy, you're going to have some attitudes at times and how I handle them is very important and how he handles my response to handling them is very important. So our bonding is going very well. Uh, but you, you see the reluctance at times or the, almost the guilt of you know, when he's bonding with me, you'll, you'll notice the guilt at times that he, he sort of feels. Yeah, I can understand that. And by the way, listeners, me. listeners, oh, will, 
li- listeners will probably uh, notice that you're having your voice is having trouble, and that's because of a connection issue we're having. But we're just going to kind of uh, move through it, not worry about it too much. But if if you hear jo- Joel start to you know stutter a little bit, that's not Joel. He actually knows how to talk. That's the connection talking. So don't worry about it. Yeah, thank you. Well, we're we're having some technical difficulties this evening. We can't resolve, but uh, it's been a, a quite a journey, and the bonding process is there. There is a, a lot more to it than than people realize involved with happiness, or or deep down inside of of what drives us. Our bonds really are a definition at times of who we are, and not just with people, but as we said, with concepts and ideas. And, and willingness to to allow the law of attraction to work is it bonding with that concept of, of the law of attraction is, is really what we talk about every week. Not just not just understanding it, but doing it and feeling it every week. And that's really the key, isn't it? Because what we're talking about is how do we apply this very simple but at the same time very complex concept on a day-to-day basis and do it in a way where we're consistent, we're keeping our focus where it needs to be, we're taking our focus away from it, from where it definitely does not need to be, and when we're talking about uh, relating to and interacting with a, a young boy, we're trying to do the same thing for him. You're trying to, to basically set an example for him and give him the kinds of, of positive uh, ongoing experiences that he wasn't getting before. That, that's a, a lot going on there. So it becomes really important to maintain focus through that kind of activity. Well, it really is. And there's a, there's a natural push-pull to the process that, that I'm trained for, I'm prepared for, I've done this before. But it's an interesting move closer, pull away, uh, very subtle type things that uh, you'll, you'll notice uh, that takes place. And having the the knowledge of that and understanding the process of bonding is very helpful when you're dealing with it. And it helps me. Uh, I don't take anything personally. That's one thing that I had to to, to learn in, in doing foster care and eventually adopting my previous two sons is I can't take anything personally because it's not personal. No, not really. I mean, stuff happens. That's just part of life. Yes. And, and in fact, part of the the challenge, if you will, in life or or the, the thing that we strive for is not to take things too seriously. And that's really what that amounts to. It's not taking it too seriously. It's, it's not getting bent out of shape about the little stuff because little stuff actually is that's part of the, the joy of, of having an 11 year old anyway. But it's certainly not anything to sweat. And sweating it is counterproductive. Right. It doesn't work in terms of the law of attraction. It's actually the opposite of what you're trying to do. You're trying to attract the stuff that you enjoy, not the stuff that you don't enjoy. So why would we sweat it? And yet it's amazing how often we do it. Well, and, and here's, here's a really great example that I, I used for years ago with my son, TJ, that I adopted. And uh, uh, TJ had this really bad habit of drumming. I don't know if you know any ADD people that drum, Walt, but they they take their fingers and play the drums on the table all the time. That's what TJ did. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, it, it, and uh, I don't have to tell the parents out there how annoying that could possibly get after, you know, 15 days. Uh, it, 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 it's one of those things that you don't understand what's going on in his head, but you're watching him beat the table over and over and over. And at some point you get really tired of it. Uh, then the, the, then you ask him to stop, and then he doesn't stop. And I can either make a really big deal about that. So here's an example of how I learned to let go of the little stuff is I asked him one day, I said, TJ, could you please stop drumming? I know you don't do it to annoy me, uh, but it, it can become very annoying. Can you please stop? Well, he looked me square in the eye, and he did two more drums, like boom, boom. <laughs> Just to get you. Just, Just to drill to get, it in a little bit. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so the, the the question that I had to do internally in a very short period of time, do I want to make a big deal out of the fact that he did the extra two, or do I want to focus on the fact that he, he really did stop? And what I chose to look at was he stopped, and I thanked him for that. I said, thank you. And I, that was the last we heard of it. Now, I mean, he didn't stop drumming in the future, but he at least would stop when I asked, and he most likely would get that extra one or two, and I would learn not to let it bother me. Which is really cool. And it, it reminds me, actually, of an Abraham Hicks email that went out just a couple of days ago. 
because it fits perfectly to what we're talking about. So let, let me read it to you, okay? It says, if we had a child or anyone and we caught them doing something inappropriate, we would not amplify it with our words. We would identify what it is we do not want, and then out of it would come the rocket of desire of what we do want. And then we would just visualize, visualize, visualize until we find peace within our vision. And when you make someone and their action the heart of a vision that you spent time on, your relationship improves, your experience is better, and they receive the benefit of the experience. But if you catch them and see them and worry about it and put mechanisms in place to prevent it, now you have not only amplified it, you have now made a commitment that is hooking you both into it until usually it gets big enough that you break apart and then you attract others to fulfill the same role. That pretty much fits it. Wow. It really does. And, and that, that's, that's the example as, I'm, as, as those examples like that are, are what I'm looking toward. When I, what am I trying to accomplish here? Am I going to allow the little things of the universe taking place in my world to disrupt this bonding process or am I going to get stuck on something? Or am I going to realize he's got his own journey, I have my own journey, and together – we're going to create a new journey, and that's that's the way I'm viewing it. It 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 isn't trying to take away what his past was; it is certainly trying to create a future for both of us. And, and while acknowledging his past and and imagining that he has this uncomfortable feelings all the time about the the his previous you know, setting that he was living in, his mom and his his brothers and sisters, and I know he loves them very much. Sure. So m- my process is not to undo that; it's to create a new process for us going forward. And, and what you're also doing is you're creating a fabulous now, because that's all yes. we ever have anyway is the now. And the now you're helping yes. him create, and you're not doing it all; you're encouraging him to do it. You're helping him to do it. But boy, yes. oh boy! I mean, everything I've seen of you know the stuff that you've posted on Facebook and so forth. Oh, is he embracing the now? Let me tell you. Oh, he, he he's, he's loving. I had a, a he he gave me a great lesson that I, I needed to uh, remind myself of, and and he we had a similar talk like this before, and I, uh, but he was going to school. Our weather has been up and down, crazy hot, all this, and um, the other day I had mentioned to him, I said, um, your your pants are a little short. And he, he was wearing long pants, and they were right about at his ankles. And he's growing at 11, you can imagine, that it's oh, hard sure. to keep him in clothes. Absolutely. And and he said, and I said, you know, do you want to change? And he goes, no, they're fine. And I said, well, when I was younger, people made fun of high pants. They called them high waters. And he, he just sort of acknowledged, you know, and I said, well, I did you know, he said it, it was really embarrassing, and I didn't want people to, to call, you know, say that. And his question was so simple and so dead on that I, I was embarrassed that he's the one that brought it up. He goes, why did you care what they said? <laughs> I got to love it. Oh, my goodness. That's great. And I and I just I just was like, uh, yeah, well, I, I don't know. I don't know. why. <laughs> so our roles reversed. But he's this very energetic, very positive uh, he, he he's picks up on a lot. Him and I talk a lot about the law of attraction, what you think about, what you bring about. And when you get in, you know, keep trying to, to, to look at the good and not focus on the bad because the bad is, is it's there, but it, it doesn't take away from right now, because if you want to look at his situation right now at this exact moment, he's in a very good place right now. So if you can live mentally within that place, it's a wonderful thing. It's a terrific thing, and it's the wonderful gift that you're able to give to him. But what's even more amazing is, just, now again, I don't really know him at all. I certainly have never met him, other than a little quick, quick brief thing we did um, online uh, off one of our shows. But um, other than that, I know nothing about him besides what you posted in Facebook. And yet, just the little bits of information you've p- pasted there have told me, this kid gets it. He yes. really gets it. He really does. And you see it. You see it. Uh, his, his teacher just loves him. I, I get glowing reports of you know, the after school program. Everybody likes him. Uh, and, and it isn't just about how people like you, but his attitude is infectious. And, and one of the things that, that we uh, as people, as humans want to do is I, I find being around some people drain me being around some people that energize me. I, 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 I get vibrations from people I, I, they're energy drainers and there's energy boosters and he's certainly an energy booster he's attract you know people are attracted to him he's a good-looking kid but he's he's just very open shakes his hand sticks his hand out shakes 
Texas and of whoever's around and with a big smile. And I've seen, I've taken him to the gym with me. And uh, I know, of course, I've been lifting for years. I know everyone in the gym. And to see, you know, a 300-pound biker with it's always got a scowl on his face, just bend it over, shake his hand, and smile, and <laughs> and you know, I mean, it, it it's amazing when I see the effect he has on other people. A fantastic effect. I can, I mean, I'm trying to imagine myself at that age. I'm trying to remember what I was like when I was 11. I'm sure I wasn't like that. I was probably very serious, um, very reserved. Certainly not the kind of outgoing, friendly kid you're describing. I'm thinking, boy, oh boy, does he have it over me? He's just really flying. Fantastic. Right. And 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 you know, as as he continues to practice his his, his version of understanding the law of attraction, and you know, at the same time, let's be clear, he's an 11 year old boy. So there's certain behaviors attached with being an 11 year old boy that are 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 there. And and so there's a as he matures and as he approaches uh, you know puberty as he gets closer to all that stuff, I'm sure there's going to be stuff that comes along. But as long as his attitude, if he understands his attitude, remains in his control, and that's what I'm always telling him. So you you're in charge of your happiness, and even you know being 11 and being placed in foster care and removed from your mother's home is a horrible a, a horrible event that has to leave you incredibly. F- powerless the feeling the feeling of powerlessness has to be really really the on your thought yes and when i have, have explained that yes that piece of that was out of his control however the piece that he is in control of his perspective of all that you look how you know while i certainly know you 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 love your mom and i don't know all the details of what was happening there look where you're at now you're an incredible we we live in a very nice neighborhood he's in a very great you know very good school i love the school that he's at he has a great after school program we get to go on trips all the time do fun things he's in taekwondo uh, so he's living a very fulfilled life does that make up for what he's been through i'm not suggesting it does but he gets to choose which life he focuses on he could focus on the lack or the loss of, or he could focus on the abundance of what he has right now. And he's doing a really good job in staying right now. That staying right now, well, first of all, let's be honest. It is a lot easier when you're you're in a good place. It's just easier to focus on it. But beyond that, he still has to stick there, like you say, during the difficult stuff that happens. Because difficult stuff does happen. It's just part of being alive. And the good news is that as you say, as he matures, as he gets older, goes through puberty and so forth, if he maintains this positive attitude that you're helping him to instill, I'm willing to bet that that stuff is going to be really minimal. It's not going to be the major blown out of proportion thing that it is for so many kids because his attitude just won't let it happen. It, it, it Probably a lot of it will just kind of fly by him and he'll say, what do you mean? Right. Well, and, and that, you know, the, there was a, we had an incident this weekend, you know, after a couple of very busy days. I believe it was Saturday morning, and, and we were preparing for the big game Saturday evening. And uh, uh, he was dragging, you know, he was getting up, and he, if, if I was saying something was black, he was saying it was white. So I could tell there was a little bit of something going on. And I said, I said, well, you know, get your shoes on, and we'll go get something to eat. And his response was, uh, okay, I'm really hungry. And I said, okay, well, we'll go get something to eat as soon as you get your shoes on. So about three minutes later, looks at me and he goes, I'm really hungry. And I said, and you are preventing yourself from eating because you haven't put your shoes on yet. So you can either complain about being hungry and we can keep doing this or you could get your shoes on and we can go eat. But at the end of the day, it's your choice. You're you're in complete control of the outcome of this. And. He had a little about, I don't know, probably two or three minutes of pouting. And then he's like, let's go. He was fine. <laughs> he, 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 and and, and it was, he, you could tell he processed it. Now, on top of that, Walt, giving, you know, we had, we had spent all day driving on Thursday. We spent well into the evening had, eating a ton of food. Play, he played nonstop with the other kids uh, in the neighborhood in South Carolina that we're staying at. Uh, and then we went that entire next day on Friday and played paintball all day. Then when it had pizza, and so he was exhausted Saturday morning. So Absolutely. even within the within the and he didn't realize he was exhausted. Mm. Uh, so that that explains a lot of it. But even within that context, we were able to have a very therapeutic moment there of 
yes, I know you're hungry, but whining about it and complaining about it is not helping you get food. In fact, it's keeping you from getting food because you're not putting your shoes on, which is the only key to you getting food is putting your shoes on, period. And what's so cool about that is how you insisted on sticking to what you know is is the, the rule about empowering people. Right. You insisted on sticking to that rule, and in doing so, even though he wasn't feeling up to it, even though he was so hungry he could barely stand, it got through. And when it yeah. got through, it didn't get through in a way that was designed to you know, control him or to manipulate him in some way. It was designed to empower him to decide. He could decide how he was going to react to this horrible feeling of hunger that he had. Right. And he got there. It takes a little time when you're under that kind of a of a hunger curse, if you will, or you're, oh, God, I just can't wait till I dig my teeth into something. When you're yes. in that place, that's hard to think in. So it took a while, but he did it. And he did it because you empowered him. Yes, and, and that, that's that's the, the key with ourselves when we empower ourselves. Each of us face those same grown-up choices, but they're disguised differently. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, we, we, uh, I, I have a young, uh, a young lady that I'm working with right now, and she has uh, uh, been a, a very specific tax accountant for a long time. What I mean by that, she works in a field of expertise for uh, uh, dealing with uh, attorneys and their tax issues. And so she's done that for years. And right now, the way taxes are, it used to be, uh, you know, pretty hard to do your own taxes. But with all the software things out there and all, and, you know, attorneys have their own staff, there's less of a demand for outsourcing of doing taxes for most attorneys. So she is her clientele is drying up. The company that she works for is actually going to cease operations. Now, she's a licensed attorney, uh, but it's, again, she's only done one type of, of law and dealing with tax law specifically for attorneys. It's that narrow. Sure. So it, it, it was very, it, it's a very complicated story, but I'll try to make it as simple as possible. So she was stuck on, she said, I've applied to 50 jobs around the United States and no one's hiring. And I said, but you're applying to the same industry that is folding. You, that, that, that industry doesn't need you anymore. They don't need anybody anymore. So she couldn't hear that she was in a redundant way of thinking. And, and I'm sympathetic and, to her, by the way, because I've done the exact same thing. I, I know exactly where she's coming from on this. But you were absolutely right. That was precisely the thing to tell her, because that's what she most needed to hear at that particular moment in time. Right. And so I, I said, so the willingness to look outside of that, she said, but I'm not, I have no experience outside of that. She's very uncomfortable stepping. I said, you have experience in tax law. You've, you're the one that's decided that it's specific to attorneys. The tax laws are, and, and I'm sure there are some very specific things, you know, attorneys that win huge cases and get these big settlements, uh, they have certain tax rules that go apply to them that the average person doesn't have to do. Sure. I said, but you're, you're a very bright lady. She's only 45 years old, has a law degree. And all is she, all she's looking at is I'm, I have no options and I'm stuck and I, I've applied to 50 jobs. So the more jobs she's applies to, nobody's responding. Um, several of these companies that deal with this specific type of law are shutting down. So she doesn't know what to do. So f we have, I've been trying to get her to turn the, the course. You have a very desirable degree. You have a license in law. There are limitless laws out that, there that you know, law offices that need different types of help. Just because one area is draw, dried up, why not look at another? Or take that wild step and say, maybe look broader than even law, just because that's all you think you know what's out there. So this has gone on for quite a while. And and I was I was you know, about ready to, to, to tell her that I, I wasn't going to be able to help her because her unwillingness to uh, look at it is, is – and, and before I did that, I, I, I decided that would be pretty harsh and, and – so I, I did some research. I found two firms in New York City that are desperately seeking attorneys to help with uh, their, their collection attorneys. Mm -hmm. And ironically, they collect money for attorneys 
from big corp, it was all corporate stuff. It didn't like mom and pop people. I mean, right. So like, say for example, Walmart hires an attorney and they, they settle a case and uh, they send the bill to Walmart. Walmart just doesn't pay it or forgets to pay it or whatever. She actually helps collect money for attorney firms. That, that's what this firm does. Uh-huh. And I said, so I talked to the guy that, that had put me up with that the firm that was looking and and they said oh my goodness we'd be very interested in talking with her (laughs) well ironically when she called them most of her knowledge translates very easily in fact it's an area that helps their firm greatly wow to be able to you know help with all this and again it's very complicated so I, i can't explain it very well but she had some points that she said you can help us with our collections in, in a lot of different ways. Sometimes it's attorney firms that owe money to other attorney firms. So it's like, there's a lot of complicated stuff. Long story short, she's flying up for an interview. She's very excited. I'm pretty confident she's going to get the job. And they were excited to have her, and they're, they're giving her a very low for that's a little more than she was making before. No if, kidding. If she, if, yes. So uh, this is big stuff, really big stuff. But it wasn't till she was able to totally get out of this belief system that I'm stuck on this path of that I, that nobody could get me through. And that that's that's I see that so much, Walt. It's like I am a I'm an accountant, so all I can do is accounting. It's like you're you're not looking at the universe's possibility. You're stuck on this. That's one of those times when it's actually good to ask the universe for help. Yes. It's a good time yes. to just kind of put out there, you know, depending on what your religious beliefs are or whatever, you can do it to fit your particular belief system. But the general idea is just put it out there onto the ether and say, I don't know how to solve this. I don't know what it is I'm supposed to be doing. I can't think of anything else I'm supposed to be doing. Give me some clues, guys. Give me something. You know, give me, give me show me something that I should be looking at here. And, and I'm going to trust that somehow you're going to deliver that message to me. That's that I have seen it happen countless times. I've, I've witnessed it. I've read about it. Uh, I've watched, I've, I've shared on this program. It's been a while. I, I knew an accountant in Charlotte that lost his job during the recession. He worked for bank of America and, and they, they laid him off and he couldn't find work. And he was, he was very close to, making some really poor choices. I mean, he even was suicidal as far as he couldn't find any work. And through a a crazy chain of events, he now owns one of the largest waste disposal companies in the Southeast. And it started with him taking local people's garbage to the dump to earn extra money. And he didn't do, he did that because he didn't have, the universe sort of put that in front of him. And, and the way that worked was, hey, it, it was a slow process of how you go from he makes – I mean, he's, he's very wealthy now because of this, way beyond what he would have ever made in accounting. And, and, and he now laughs at the fact that he thought the accounting – because he couldn't find an accounting job, he, he just – it was over. And he says, my goodness, it's so clear now what I need, where my mind is, what I got to do, when, when, and not get stuck inside the box. That's so cool. That, that's really cool because it shows a couple of things. It shows just how far he was able to come, despite the fact that he felt he had these limitations, and how much better off he ended up when he got there, far exceeding any expectations that he had when he first started messing around with you know, this little thing to earn some pocket money just to kind of survive. It's amazing how that well, stuff works. It, it is, Walt, and, and I, I – I often will, I probably get four or five job offers a year to run a treatment center. Uh, I, I, I had one recently, a very lucrative offer. The guy flew up, he made a presentation, and and I was confident. I told him, I asked him not to waste his money flying up, uh, that I was confident that I was going to say no, but I would listen because, not because I want to entice him or make him believe I, I plan on taking it, but I do believe in listening to every opportunity that presents itself. And he flew up, and I didn't want the job, but I, 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 I still listened. I'm just not shut down to the concept of, of what I want to do. 
uh, or, or what the universe wants me to do or what's going to fit what it, what that next step is, I'm always open to, to suggestions. Uh, and you don't have to act on them, but it's a nice thing to, to be in a position to randomly turn down $200,000 a year jobs. Yeah, that, that's a good position to be in. That, I yes. actually envy that one right now. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it, because it, it's such a uh, – you know, it's such a no-brainer in my mind. I love what I'm doing now. I'm, I'm making good money. I have I do my own schedule. I, I have a lot of positive attached to work in my life right now, mm. and I, I, I'm, I'm very pleased. I have a I, I we always talk about this. I I am sincerely convinced that when our radio show does get the the right people listening to it or the attention is drawn to the right people we have the format for a very successful morning drive time radio show oh i can hardly wait doing what we're doing now with call-in guests and sort of helping them implement the law of attraction i mean i see that i visualize that every night having people drive to work walking in the door very positive listening to us it's better than hearing you know howard stern talk about someone's breast size or penis size <laughs> uh I, I, well you know that 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 is uh uh something that I I don't see any redeeming value in. What I think we offer is a chance to to really have people make a difference when they start listening. I and I know it won't be for everyone, but I, I, I am very confident this will catch on and it will happen. Uh, so that's one of the things that that I believe is in the turnpike for us. It's in the, it's in the works right now. We were talking a moment ago about what it's like to kind of well, we, we were projecting the idea of how good it is to put out there, you know, universe help me, give me some clues, give me some information. I've actually been practicing that for myself just in the last few days um, because of uh, my own situation financially. And one of the ways that I've been doing it is I've been going through this one channel where I can just pick up little bits of pocket change. That's about it, doing various kinds of little um, writing tasks and proofreading and stuff like that. And I got a job just today, little little tiny one, just a few bucks, to uh, write a short little sales pitch for a therapist, a uh, therapist who deals primarily with um, single women who are having relationship issues. Now, that's not the way she originally presented it to me, but um, the way she originally presented it to me was, well, here's what I have for you know what I use now, and I need to improve it some way. I looked it over, and it was your typical blurby stuff that, you know, if, if you've picked up a brochure of a therapist like this, that's what you'd expect to see on it. And, it, you know, it puts you to sleep within, like, the first paragraph. So it's not terribly right. effective stuff. And so I looked at it and said, well, I certainly can do better than that. Um, and I, I walked through an exercise that I do with people who I'm trying to write copy for. Copywriting, by the way, in case you aren't aware of it, copywriting is the art of writing text for the purpose of selling something, maybe a service or a product or something like that. But that's what copywriting is. So I was doing some copywriting for her. Anyway, um, I couldn't write copy based on what she gave me because a lot of what's involved in effective copywriting, well, there's really two important things. One is everything that involves a sale involves emotion. And if you can tap into what that emotion is, you're going to write the most effective copy that you could write. The second thing is know, knowing who you're going to write to. Now, originally, the input she gave me was that she needed to be able to reach out to people and tell them about her services. So I'd ask her, you know, well, tell me about, you know, your, your biggest, your, your most common client. What, what, what characteristic do they have in common? And she gave me these very generic answers. Um, I, I asked her at one point, um, what's the one characteristic that they have most in common in terms of their, their problems? And she came back with, well, they all lack confidence. And I said, yeah, that's true. But what I mean is, what's the problem from their perspective? That's the problem from your perspective. You're the therapist. You're trying to solve that. So, of course, that's what you see every single time. But that's not what they see. They're seeing stuff like, you know, oh, I'm overweight or um, I don't have a job or um, my husband hates me or, you know, that kind of stuff. Or I'm being beaten up or whatever it is. What's, what's it from their perspective? She wrote back and said, wow, I completely forgot I have to do that. So she tried to do it, still didn't do it right. We had to go through like three or four of these iterations before she finally told me that the majority of her clients were single women who were in unhealthy relationships. Once I had that, I said, okay, now I can write something. So I wrote this little blurb up, you know, two or three hundred words, something like that. And I, I, I literally, Joel, I wrote it in five minutes. It was that quick. 
Wow. <laughs> because when you, I, I'm, I'm good enough at this stuff. I've done enough of it that, you know, when I'm writing it, it just kind of flows. And the nice thing about doing it on a, on a cheapy job like this, where you're not making much anyway, is you don't have to go out of your way to make it just perfect the way you hope the client wants it. You can just go wild with it. Because, I mean, if the client doesn't like it, what are you out? You're out a few bucks. Who cares? It's not a big deal. Right. You know, so you just kind of throw yourself at it. So I just did kind of a stream of consciousness thing. And, and when I was doing it, I was focusing on that one thing I mentioned first, the emotion. Because, um, and to give people who don't really understand this concept, let me just kind of touch on it a bit. Anything that involves a sale has an emotional hot button to it. Uh, otherwise, there wouldn't be a sale. That's why people buy things, whatever it might be, anything from a, a piece of cheese up to a car. There's always an emotional back channel that's driving that. Um, people will often think of it in terms of, of the practical stuff, you know, the, the features of a car that you're buying or the practical reason why you need to buy the car. But even the practical reason has an emotional backstory to it. I mean, if you're buying a car because you have a family and you know, it's the only practical thing for your family, guess what? You're buying on emotion because you love your family. It's not because of how practical it is. It's because you care about your family. So that's the thing you have to understand when you're writing copy. You have to say to yourself, okay, what's the emotional hot button I'm trying to address here? Press that emotional hot button and then show them what the solution is. That That's the essence of copywriting. So that's what I'm doing. I'm sitting down at, and, and literally, I mean, I, I could even read a piece of it to you, but I, I didn't even think of it in terms of here is a therapist who's offering a service. I just thought of it in terms of that client who is sitting in the chair, much like what you get every day when you're dealing with your clients and how they're reacting and, and what kind of uh, emotion that they're giving off as they're going through their therapy with, with this particular therapist. And of course, what often happens is that, you know, as, as they reach the crisis in the story that they're talking about, that's when the emotions come out and so forth. So I just, I just painted that emotional scene. I have painted the scene of, you know, the client sitting there and, and she's kind of shivering and quaking a little bit and her eyes are filling up with tears and the therapist is really feeling for it. That, that's really what I wrote about. And I sent that off to her after about, you know, literally five minutes of writing, came back a message. How do I give this guy seven stars instead of five? So I thought, well, wow. that, that's a pretty good response. I like that one. I like that one a lot. Yeah. And, and, and I'm thinking, I have no idea how to turn this into a major career. I've never been a world-class world uh, copywriter. It, and there are very few people who are. And they have a very narrow niche. A very, it's a very limited market of people who are willing to pay good money, literally like thousands of dollars, to a copywriter to do a big copywriting job. So I, I don't have any delusions that that's likely to happen. But the fact that this felt so good and the fact that it went so easily, once I could get her narrowed down to what it was she actually did. <laughs> but once I, I got through all that, I said, wow, I wonder what this is going to lead to. Because I do know from what we talk about that when you're focused on something that you're enjoying that much and it feels that good and it flows that easily, something's going to come out of it. So that's my point. That's why I told this whole shaggy dog story was I don't know what this is going to lead to. I have no way of picturing where it could possibly go. And yet, because it was so positive, I just know it's got to go somewhere. Well, and, and Walt, that, that piece that you're, that exact point is sort of the crux of what I try to get people to do. I don't know if that leads you directly to copy, writing copyright. I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> I do know that it will lead you to where you need to be if yeah. you allow it to. Yeah. That's the piece that, that you know, you, you, you can't get stuck on a certain outcome, but you allow it to walk you through. Allow the thing to take you to where it needs to be taken. So look for it. It, it doesn't hurt now. You're good at it. Why not try to see see where that takes you? I don't know how to do it yet, but at least get that mindset going. It may lead to that next step. Well, that's what happens because, I mean, literally, as I'm doing this, I was just having a blast, which is not a normal work experience for me. Most of the time, I'm grinding. Most of the time, I'm just, you know, get it done, turn it out, do all that stuff. This one was just fun. It, it, I mean, once we got past that initial discussion, it just flowed. And that's a wonderful yeah. experience. It makes it really easy to focus on. Yeah, I want more of that. <laughs> well, and, and that 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 piece is so. You know, I, I know when I'm 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 talking with uh, a potential client or their mother on the phone. Um, it's usually the mom that the younger guys. The the mom wants to talk, and the mom sort of has a, an opinion, and I can tell them exactly what they're going to tell me quicker than they can tell me. 
<laughs> your your son is uh, not performing near to the level that he could perform at. He's much smarter. Uh, he and I could go through the whole process, and when and they're going, how did you know that? I go, I, that's every kid I work with. <laughs> yeah. it, it and and what, all I have to do is that. And they said, when can we get in to see you? Right. And that's all it takes. Yeah. If that's all it takes. And and so you you've figured out you know whether. No matter what, as you're saying, no matter what industry or wherever you're at, what is the driving force behind that industry? What is what buttons are not what the therapist thinks she's doing? What are her patients thinking they need? And you know, it. it uh, I have a personal trainer friend who's one of the best personal trainers in the world. Truly, he, he's a world class personal trainer. He hates drama. He hates to talk about anything except working out. Mm. He was struggling financially. He's like, I don't understand. He said, I've trained some of the best athletes in the world, and I don't know why I can't attract clients to establish a base salary. And I said, because they're not looking for you to train them. They're looking for you to listen to their drama. They're listening to you to hear about their problems. They're, they want you to be a therapist slash trainer, not just a trainer. And he said, I hate that. And I go, well, then, then find a new career. because." And, and by the and, way, there's, there's the reason why they're not there anymore. Yeah, exactly. That's the whole point. And, and so after he said, okay, well, you're going to have to help me. So him and I did some work. The moment he changed and he realized that they and, – and he said – and he knows he's not qualified to give therapy, but he can listen. He can re tell them how strong they are by, by withstanding all that this they're going through, that, that he can – reinforce them positively well he has a waiting list now a huge waiting list. no kidding wow and all he all he did was change that one piece because it it they're they're really not good they don't i said do you really believe that this mother of three this soccer mom who's coming to see you two, two or three times a week do you really believe she wants to be a world-class athlete or does she just want to get in shape and he goes well clearly get in shape i go so why why do you, why does she need a world class trainer? <laughs> oh wow, what a great line. Fantastic. And so once he got the concept, now he's all and 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 actually he's learned to enjoy it. I said if you hate it, it still won't be good. So he's learned to embrace it and and he said, Oh my goodness, Joel, he said he said they they don't even care about the working out part hardly. They're talking about how great they feel. And, and he said, I'm not doing anything, just reinforcing them positively. Like you said, just saying, you know, giving a, an empathetic ear. And even when they're, as he said, even when their problems are ridiculous, I, I, I side with them. I said, well, your husband doesn't know the, you know, what you're doing. He's thinking, oh, my God, mm -hmm. they're doing nothing. They're doing nothing. But, <laughs> you know, that's not what I'm telling them. You know, how strong, you know, and, and that's that's where he all of a sudden has a limitless number of clients at this point. And and that's that's within the law of attraction. That's the exciting piece of the law of attraction is you can tweak your situation. You can in and, and what I'm loving what you're you're saying about your situation, Walt, that you you've shared with us, uh, you know, the idea that you're putting this out there. You you identify you love doing that copyright. You'd loved it. So don't get stuck on that course of action of only I'm going to be a copywriter now. No. But, but what you can do is say, wow, there's the, I love that. So there's something in that general area that I love. And if I attract that to my life and figure out a way to make a living doing that, wow. Actually, I'm tying it into what I talked about previously about putting it out to the universe. Hey, universe, I don't really know how to turn this into something. Tell me yeah. something. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and that, you know, that, and that's that gentleman I told you about that had the, uh, uh, waste disposal company. That's how it started. You know, I stopped by his house and he said, here, you want to ride with me to the dump? I got to take garbage. And I asked him, why don't you have a garbage bin? He says, well, he said, we're sort of spread out here. We're rural and nobody services this area. And he stopped by three neighbors to pick up their garbage on the way. I said, well, would they give you $25 a month to carry the garbage? I'm sure they would. I said, well, how many roads are there? So like 20. I said, well, and 10 people on each road, let's say. I, I mean, well, wow. <laughs> that I mean, starts what? to add up pretty quick. Yeah, I said, well, you know, what if you're making, you know, $1,000 a week just carrying people's garbage locally here? He said, well, that'd be good. Well, once he did that, then all of a sudden, uh, miraculously, the, the a local city was selling one of their old garbage trucks that went wow. up for auction for very little. He bought that. And, and, and all of a sudden, it blossomed. 
and, and to you know, it, it, I don't, I forget at one time he had you know something like six hundred trucks throughout the southeast. Oh my goodness! Oh, it's huge, and and it started. <laughs> When he let the universe, the universe is screaming, and, and I'll sort of direct it toward you, Walt, but our audience, it's screaming at you. It's just you got to tune into it. Yeah. It wants you to be. It wants this to work. It, it, it's there. It's a point. You you put it out there. It has to fill the void. Help it fill the void by listening to what it's telling you. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it's hard to listen sometimes because the thing I think that, that makes it most difficult is we want an immediate answer. I just asked the question, it's been a minute, what's taking so long? Right. And it doesn't necessarily come that quickly. It can. I'm not saying it won't. I'm just saying it doesn't necessarily, which means yeah, this is the hardest part for me. It may not be for others, but I know it is for me. Putting it out there and letting it go. One of, one, this will probably be the only time in the history of, of radio uh, that er, anyone has ever used the uh, analogy derived from the movie The Man with Two Brains by Steve Martin. <laughs> um, but I'm going to do it. I'm okay. Do it. Well, we're making uh, so, radio history here. <laughs> so uh, if, if you have the ability to record this, please record it because <laughs> nobody else. There is a scene in, in which I relate to so much. I'm a big Steve Martin fan. Um, and and it, when I was a child, I, I just would stay up late when he was on Saturday Night Live. And I, I just think he's hilarious. Uh, and he did a movie called The Man with Two Brains. And the dilemma of this movie is he was a scientist that learned how to transfer a brain into in between bodies, like a brain transplant. Well, his wife, but it was considered unethical. But he he his wife was killed in a uh, or in, in, a, in an accident. And so he wanted to transfer a very smart woman's brain into the, the, the you know, the body. And so there's a whole moral dilemma going on. And there's a scene where he's in a church and he, he's already made up his mind. He wants to do it, but he's praying to God. He said, God, if you don't want me to do this, please give me a sign. And he's on his knees. And all of a sudden the church starts shaking. Boulders start falling to the ground. And you got a picture of Steve Martin, how he shuts his eyes real tight and he's shaking his head. Yes, yes, yes. And, and he's looking around and, and this goes on for like five minutes. They overdo it in a good way. And finally the dust settles and everything clears. And Steve Martin goes, any sign, God, any sign. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it, you know, it's like the universe. Sometimes they send a garbage truck. They, they make a garbage run. The universe says, do this. You put it out there, fill the void. Today, you put it out there. This copyright thing goes. The, pursue it in whatever that means. I, I wish this is where my job gets difficult when I'm working with clients. I can't tell you exactly what to do, but I can tell you that's where your energy needs to go, that direction. The only thing I know for sure is what Mike Dooley teaches. I think he gives us the best way to handle that particular question, which is, don't just pick up a rock or two. Pick up all the rocks. All See the rock. what's Absolutely. under all the rocks. You don't right. know until you pick them all up. Right. And I love that idea of not getting stuck on, I have to do this or this line of work or this direction. Let me put it out there. Let's see what happens. And, and when the universe is filling voids, it does it in the way it wants to do it. And, and that's the piece that, that is hard to accept with the law of attraction. When you're stuck on one course of action, that is not using the law of attraction to your benefit. It is, it, it doesn't work that way. It's putting it out there and allowing the void to be filled and not care how it's felt. By the way, an interesting thing has been happening while we've been recording the show. I don't know if you noticed it. I'm certainly hearing it perhaps more than you do because when your voice has a connection issue, and I'm doing the recording. I'm the one who tends to hear it rather than you. Although you'll sometimes hear it because at your end, it'll sound like I'm distorted or whatever, even though the recording doesn't hear that. Well, a, an interesting thing has happened. When we started off doing the show today, we were getting quite a few of these little glitches where your voice was just kind of breaking up and so forth. And as the show progressed, it happened less and less. As the show progressed, we were also talking about more and more positive stuff. And now we're on this really high flying stuff. And you know what? Your voice is as clear as can be. Coincidence? Wow. I don't think so. I don't. I believe, that, and that's the point. It, that's how it. All this, we, we had talked before the show, and and not divulging any confidences or anything. But you said you'd been struggling a little bit this week, mm -hmm. and and, yep. and 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 our show struggled with our connection early. Immediately. But, yes. 
and as we have done this, and now you know, you, you know, you shared your very positive story about the copywriting, but I, not even the positive story. But the how you felt is what it is. I'm impressed. By. Yes, you love doing it. You felt good about it. That's the key. That that's where you, we need to fire our energy at. Uh, turn over all the rocks surrounding that. Look at everything like that. Uh, just, just copyright jobs, Google it. I mean, everything, just see what's out there and let the universe say, I, I want to do it. I'm doing this end of it. And the other side of it is to continue to enjoy it. I mean, as we're talking about it, I, I, I wish you could, this is the one bad thing about radio. You can't see us. Eventually they'll be able to see us, but right now they can't see us. And right yes. now I'm wearing this big grin on my face as we're doing this conversation. That just, I mean, it, it indicates just how, positive just how good i feel about that little tiny insignificant incident that happened earlier which obviously is not terribly insignificant but it just it seemed that at the time and it's just blossoming into this thing right and and that that's that's what i believe that's that's what i've witnessed in my personal life uh the, the how when you turn over those rocks, when you investigate every every opportunity, when you even and never shut down the idea of something, never never say, well, that's just not what I do, or that doesn't work. When when one one of the things that when I used to run a treatment center and I had a team together, I I, I have literally let people go over, and I tell people this is not being a tyrant, but I, I I warn people about this ahead of time. If I say I want to do something, let's figure out how to do it. If you tell me it can't be done, you're not a part of my team any longer. If you tell me, oh, we can do it. Now, it may be cost prohibitive, and we may not want to spend the money to do it, but here's how. Here's the way. There's a way to do it. If I'm asking to do it, there's a way to do it. And that concept for me, now, it, it, it is the price that I'm willing to pay on that? I, I don't know. That, that might be a very deciding factor. But everything's doable. Uh, if, if you want to 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 make, if you can envision it, it's doable, and that that's the idea that I'm approaching. Then that's what you're doing, by the way, Walt. Is is using that mindset, that clarity of thought, that that I love doing this. That my emotion of instead of I've been struggling. Wow, this feels. Let's focus on that positive emotion today. That's where your energy lies. That's where all your strength lies, and and whatever may happen down the road certainly may be of concern today but right now today you're in a really good place right now today it, it, this is really weird joel I, I don't know how to tell you how weird this is but you couldn't hear it so i have to tell you the moment you started talking about don't do this don't do that the signal started to degrade i mean right. instantly it was so weird and then you turned it around and you started going back to what the positive side was. And even toward the end, it was still a little bit out of phase, but you could just hear it was starting to clear up again. I mean, how responsive is that? <laughs> That's just unbelievable. But, and that, is, and that, this is where all of your power exists. And, and, and it, the, the, the show, the, the, our connection, uh, it, it, I, I believe in all that. There's some of our audience members maybe, and okay, the guys are a little crazy this week. Don't, you don't have to go that far. You you have to figure out where this works in your life, and figure out the buttons you have to push, and 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 live in this. Live, find the positive in the day, find the positive in the now, right now. And and that if you live in that, I, my power of yesterday's an irrelevant. It doesn't matter what happened yesterday. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. I have unlimited power in my decision-making process at this exact moment. The law of attraction responds to that at this exact moment. And, and, that, and that's, you're absolutely right. I mean, just because I get excited about that doesn't mean they should have to get excited about it. But I'm excited. I'll tell you that. Because <laughs> oh, no, to, to me, this is like wonderful feedback. And I'm not saying everybody else has to buy into that. But, boy, is it jazzing me, I can tell you. Oh, it's, I, I find it, I find it amazing, and I find and I and I personally believe it as well. I, as our audience listens, I, I think they'll one day begin to believe that. Once you see this process work in your life, and, and you'll start to, to notice all kinds of things. I I see it in the the when I'm driving every day, what my mindset is when I'm driving, how traffic is, how I, I, it's amazing how my mindset dictates traffic. I, I'm amazed by that. Uh, so I, I've it, had the same thing. I still don't quite understand how that works. I guess it works the same rule, but 
I'm how how on earth is, how how is it that I drive into a parking lot at a Walmart? You know how Walmarts usually are; they're packed. And I drive into it, and we drive past an aisle that's right next to the door. And you look down the aisle, and it's just filled. You do a little loop through loop coming around, and when you come back, you come down to the very end, right near the door, and that spot just opened up. I, I, yeah, I, I, I had to stop in and get a client's prescription at Walmart in the middle of a very busy day last week, uh, a two day, uh, uh, maybe the week before. It was a couple days before Thanksgiving, and I, I was driving. And I'm dreading going to Walmart, knowing I'm going to have to park way in the back, and I got to go wait in line at the pharmacy. And I said, I stopped it. I said, Well, that's what'll happen if you believe it. Right. I I I changed my mindset. I said, This is going to be the fastest trip into Walmart. I, like you said, I pulled up. They, I pulled up very close to the front parking space right there for me. Walked in. Nobody in line at the pharmacy. They had it ready. I paid the guys three dollar copay and walked out the door. <laughs> it's crazy. It's just crazy. wow. That's never happened before, but it did that day. You know, uh, we got a few minutes left. I want to take the last few minutes to kind of set up next week's show because before we started this week's show, you and I kind of got together as we often do and decide we're going to try something. So I want to alert our listeners to make sure they tune in next week. Make sure if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, subscribe now. Um, if you're listening on PRN, you can still find us on the PRN archive. You can subscribe to us on iTunes. We are now on iTunes, hooray. We are available on YouTube, or you can just go to our website, LOAToday.net. There's a subscribe button right there. No matter what device you're using, you can subscribe and make sure that you do it because you don't want to miss next week. Because, Joel, next week we're going to start picking apart and going into the, the nitty-gritty details of one of the greatest LOA books written of all time, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Simply the the Bible of the Law of Attraction in my mind. It is it is the the really where it all, everybody that I know is a practitioner of the Law of Attraction uses – quotes, believes in, uh, was brought into the law of attraction process by this great book. It is simply the, the beginning of it all. And what's really amazing to me, today, law of attraction terminology and so forth is rampant. And it comes from a variety of sources. And, and a lot of the terminologies and the phrasing that gets used is very consistent. Um, the concept of being labeled the law of attraction is new within the last 20 years. You read Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, and you can just see where so much of this came from. He invented most of the phrasings that get used. He invented yes. things like developing a burning desire. He was the first. Nobody said that before. He was the very first. Well, actually, that's not entirely true. He was the second person to say it. He heard it first from the 500 successful industrialists and government leaders and so forth. He interviewed in order to distill all these principles down to like a 13 principle book. But amazing. He laid, he describes in intimate detail what the law of attraction is. And then he says, I don't know what's actually doing this. He had no concept of an actual law of attraction, but you described it to a T perfectly. Amazing. And, and he, for the don't know, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of give an explanation next week. But as you said, he set out to figure out what made people successful. Yeah. And he, he just went on this quest to interview the most successful people in the world. And he couldn't find anything in common. Uh, there, he, he, I think it, these are my words, not his. But there's some stupid people. There's some smart people. There are some people who started rich. There's people who, who developed. You know, all these different types. There, there was no commonality except for this belief system that he talks about, right? Which is the law of attraction. To give you a little bit of uh, advanced background on this thing, he actually did start the project at the suggestion of somebody else. That somebody yes. else was Andrew Carnegie, the famous steel yes. king. The, the steel baron, if you will. And Andrew Carnegie had him in his office when he was a young kid. I don't know how he ended up in Andrew Carnegie's office as a young kid, but somehow he did. <laughs> Some sort of a law of attraction thing was going on there, I can tell you. But anyway, he was there. And Carnegie, the, I don't remember exactly how he describes it, but it's something like this. Carnegie said to him what the secret of his, his success was. He framed it very simply in what we would call law of attraction terminology, although he doesn't share with us exactly what Carnegie said. And then he just sat back to see what the, the effect would be on the kid. In other words, he gave him no setup. He gave him no background. He just said, 
something to the effect of your thoughts become things or, or some phrasing like that. We don't really know what. Just to see how the kid would react. And apparently the young Napoleon Hill reacted well enough that Carnegie said, I want you to spend the next 25 years of your life interviewing all the successful men and I'll put you in touch with them so you can do it. So you can distill this down so that people can know about it. And that's exactly what Napoleon Hill did. He spent the next 25 years of his, 25 years of his life going out, interviewing 500 different industrialists and famous people and leaders, political leaders, all kinds of stuff, and distilling it all down to this one book. I mean, that was a lifetime achievement in every way, and he did it. Well, we're way over our time, so I'm going to have to do some editing, but Joel, it's been a pleasure as usual. Great to talk to you, my friend. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, everybody.